the Space Shuttle Columbia. Pretty near to 15 years ago, the grand old lady of the Space Shuttle fleet broke up over the southern United States nearing the end of its 28th mission. If you're interested at all in space travel, you've probably heard the story more than once. So I'm going to retell it only briefly for those who haven't heard the details, but that's not really what this video is about. There's one aspect of the story that's always given me pause more than any other, and I want to know what you think. Maybe it's a little bit early in this channel's life to be putting out questions to the viewers, but I'm nothing if not a cockeyed optimist. Anyway, we'll get to all that in a minute. I should also mention that some of this information comes from a truly excellent article written by Lee Hutchinson in 2016. I'll link to that in the description. It's really worth reading if you're into this stuff. So, it was February 1st, 2003, and Columbia had been in orbit for 16 days. It was all a routine mission, with one major exception. A piece of the external fuel tank's thick coating of insulating foam had delivered a dooming blow only a handful of seconds after liftoff. Chunks of foam had broken away under high aerodynamic loads numerous times before in the shuttle fleet's lifetime, and several of them had hit the orbiter at high speed, but nothing had ever come of it. So NASA made no changes to prevent future impacts. In an era of shrinking budgets for space exploration, any little tiny cost saving was more critical than ever. A piece of foam may not seem like a very effective bludgeoning tool, but pretty much anything can do very serious damage at a high enough relative speed. You can check out my space junk video for more examples of that. NASA's testing after the fact showed very clearly that the foam piece carried enough energy to easily punch through a brittle carbon-carbon heat-resistant tile on the leading edge of Columbia's left wing. When it was open to the atmosphere, the inner aluminum wing framework and critical hydraulic systems had no chance of resisting temperatures of nearly 3,000 degrees during re-entry. For all intents and purposes, the entire crew and the shuttle itself were lost before the mission was even two minutes old. Personnel at NASA's Mission Control routinely reviewed each launch video, looking for any reason for concern that might affect the orbital mission or the return to Earth. And they did see the piece of foam impact the orbiter's wing. Flight engineers were concerned enough to ask the Department of Defense to take pictures of the shuttle in orbit to determine if the impact had caused any damage. NASA management disagreed. They not only dismissed the concerns, but they intervened to prevent the Department of Defense from bothering with any imaging to have a closer look. The details of the DOD's role in the whole affair are still classified information. A big factor in management's lack of concern was that they believed that nothing could be done, even if the damage was critical. The shuttle simply didn't have enough propellant to reorient its orbital inclination to reach the International Space Station and allow the Columbia astronauts a safe place to wait. In fact, it wasn't even close. The shuttle would need approximately 12,600 feet per second of propellant to reorient itself to meet the ISS. What it actually had was 448 feet per second of propellant on board for only minor scheduled adjustments. So, despite numerous claims that persist even to this day, an ISS rendezvous was never a realistic option. And, although the Space Shuttle Atlantis was already being prepared for a scheduled launch four weeks later, the odds of it being ready in time to reach and rescue the Columbia crew before Columbia's atmospheric control and electrical systems failed were very, very long. Even that distant possibility relied on absolutely everything going right the first time during the Atlantis preparation, and that's not usually the way things worked with the space shuttles. It also would have required NASA to change long-standing checklists and procedures, even deleting some non-critical tasks. A panicky space launch is the worst possible time for any new procedures. A rush job to get Atlantis into orbit could result in a situation that was even much, much worse than what was already unfolding. They could have two crippled shuttles and the loss of two crews. In theory, an Atlantis rescue was possible without overtly compromising safety, but everyone knew that it would compromise safety in practice. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board suggested that the Columbia crew might have been able to fix the wound themselves out there in space. Maybe they could have used some scrounge bits of titanium sheet from around the craft and probably quite a few rolls of duct tape. The board concluded that the repair might have survived the hellish ride back through Earth's high atmosphere. Or, at the very least, it would have been better than nothing. But nothing was what eventually happened, and the shuttle's open wing structure simply couldn't withstand the heat of a compressed atmosphere. We've all seen the pictures and the videos of what happened next. Let's get back to NASA's management decisions, though. Quite quickly into the growing disaster, management seemed to give up on Columbia and its crew. According to some reports, members were already attempting to prevent future events while Columbia was still circling the globe. If you've ever worked in an office, that's probably no huge surprise. 
Here's the really interesting part, though. They consciously decided not to tell Columbia astronauts about the grave concerns. In fact, Mission Control specifically downplayed the foam strike in emails to the orbiting crew, and they told them that it was nothing to worry about. Maybe it was just stereotypical hubris, but maybe it was something else. According to former flight director Wayne Hale, he asked Director of Mission Operations John C. Harpold for an opinion, and Harpold responded with the following. You know, there is nothing we can do about damage to the thermal protection system. If it has been damaged, it's probably better not to know. I think the crew would rather not know. Don't you think it would be better for them to have a happy, successful flight and die unexpectedly during entry than to stay on orbit, knowing that there was nothing to be done until the air ran out? Hale found himself agreeing, although he later regretted doing so. Other astronauts have agreed as well. Most people involved have agreed. I agree. Okay, so here's my question to you. What do you think? If you were on the Columbia crew, and you had already prepared your loved ones for what might happen and said your potential goodbyes, would you want to know that you had hours to live? Despite how it looks on television, launches to space are incredibly risky every single time, and the crew was required to put affairs in order just in case. So, you're in low Earth orbit, and things are going very badly outside your vision. Fixing the problem is extremely unlikely, if not nearly impossible. If you know what's happening, all you can really do is worry and panic as the last few moments of your life pass by. Maybe you'd rush to attempt shaky repairs yourself, potentially dying in an even less appealing way. But if you don't know, you have the opportunity to enjoy your time left, especially when it involves seeing things that very few other humans ever get to experience. And when the end comes, as it did for them, it's over in a few seconds. Instead of filling your last few moments of life with panic and stress, maybe your last memory is of bursts of superheated plasma outside the shuttle and the anticipation of seeing your family again. Would you want to know? Tell me in the comment section. And if you like this video, please subscribe for more from the Wild AC channel. Thanks for watching.